OK, um, good evening, members, officers and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. Welcome to this meeting of the Joint Local Plan Advisory Group. My name is Councillor Katie Thornborough and I am the usual vice chair of the advisory group. However, the usual chair cannot be with us today, so I will be assuming the role of the chair for the meeting. Members, we will need to appoint a vice chair for this meeting. I would like to nominate Councillor Peter Sanford. Do I have a seconder for this proposal? I'll second chair if needs be. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Henry. Councillor Batchelor. Um, and can I take that as affirmation from members? OK, I've got nodding, so thank you very much. So, Councillor Sanford, you are appointed vice chair for this meeting. The Thank joint, you. the joint local plan advisory group is a non-decision making group comprising members of the Cambridge City Council, South Cambridgeshire District Council, and Cambridgeshire County Council, and its role is to provide a steer at member level for the development of land use plans integrated with transport strategy. We meet in public and our recommendations go back to the local planning authority for decision making. Members, I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. When your name is called, please would you unmute yourself and introduce yourself. As I stated earlier, my name is Councillor Katie Thornborough. I am the vice chair. I mean, the vice chair is Councillor Peter Sanford. Thank you. Yes, Peter Sanford, Ward Councillor for South Cam's Ward of Exton and Papworth and Temporary Vice Chair for today. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Hi, evening Chair. Councillor Henry Batchelor representing South Cam's District Council's Linton Ward and a Cabinet Member at the Authority. Councillor Katie Porra. Thank you, Chair. I'm Councillor Katie Porrer. Uh, I represent the City Council and I'm reserved, so I'm sitting in for Councillor Bick this evening. Thank you very much. Councillor Neil Shaler. Hello, yes, I'm Neil Shaler. I'm um, County Councillor, Vice Chair of Highways. Councillor Simon Smith. I'm Councillor Simon Smith. I represent Castle Ward on Cambridge City Council. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Sorry, thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. Um, I represent the villages of Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield and Newton on South Cam's Council. Thank you. May I start with a few housekeeping announcements? Please make sure that you switch your microphone off unless you are invited to speak. When you are invited to speak, please switch your microphone back on. <laughs> when you finish speaking, please turn off your microphone and ensure that, if possible, you use a headset when speaking. If you wish to speak, please would you indicate in the chat column. Please also indicate if you have to leave the meeting via the chat. Otherwise, please do use the chat. Do not use the chat column for any other purpose. This meeting is being administrated by South Cam's District Council and all the papers for this meeting can be found on their website. We have a number of officers joining us this evening. Jonathan Dixon, the planning policy manager at the Shared Planning Service, will be leading the meeting with support from other officers. John, could you kindly introduce yourself and inform us of who you have on hand to assist with the meeting? Uh, thank you, Councillor Thornborough. Um, we have uh, a good number of officers. We have uh, Bruce Waller, Principal Planning Policy Officer, Caroline Hunt, Strategy and Economy Manager, Oh, Charlotte Morgan Shelbourne, who will be taking some notes for us. Um, we have uh, Jenny Nuttercombe, Principal Planning Policy Officer. Joanna Davies, Principal Planning Policy Officer. We have Lizzie Wood and Mark Davies, Senior Planning Policy Officers. And we have Stephen Kelly, uh, our Director as well. And I think I've got everyone there. Thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda is apologies. Members, um, 
May I ask the Democratic Services Officer Lawrence Damery Homan if we have received any apologies today? Thank you very much, Chair. We've received two apologies this evening, one from Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins and the other from Councillor Bick, with Councillors Porra and Bachelor kindly stepping in as substitutes. Second item, declaration of interests. Do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If an interest is subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point? Councillor Sanford. Yes, as the uh, topic is housing, I should declare that I'm a non-remunerated director of Ermine Street Housing, which is a subsidiary of South Cam's Council. Thank you. OK, we will go on to the third item, which will be covering the home. We'll, so we cover homes, well-being and social inclusion of the local plan. May I ask John Dixon to introduce this item, please? Thank you, Councillor Thornborough. Um, yes, today this is the third uh, of our series of meetings uh, exploring the issues that were uh, raised in representations to the local plan and the many comments we received through the consultation at the end of last year. Uh, this year we're covering this meeting, we're covering the big themes of um, homes and wellbeing and social inclusion. Uh, we've broken the presentation this time up into three sections. So we'll have two sections uh, on, on the two halves of the housing policies and then a third section uh, on the wellbeing and social inclusion. Uh, after each set of policies are run through, we've left a space for um, discussion for members. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to the team who will take you through the first section. I'm going to share the slide. Going to the home general slide, please, John. Thank you. So uh, we're going to start with homes this evening. Um, and just while we've got the infographic on homes on the slide, as well as receiving comments on the individual housing proposed policies, we had some general um, comments that aren't specifically attributed to particular policies. So there was basically general support for the proposed housing policies from parish councils, Camborne Town Council and some site promoters. And the general comments were basically support, support for the local plan requiring a right, wide range of housing, like different types, sizes and tenures, as this will approve improve the ability of the market to achieve enhanced levels of delivery and will support the creation of diverse communities. And then there were some specific kind of comments on things that we should take into account, but let's move on to affordable housing being the first policy area. So in the first proposals, the, preferred, the proposed approach for this is to require 40% affordable homes to be provided on site, on sites of 10 or more dwellings with some specific exceptions. Um, it would also set out the proportions of different affordable tenures such as first homes or affordable or social rent homes or shared ownership etc. Um, and it will include other specific requirements relating to clustering and design with reference to the various housing strategy annexes. So in terms of the key comments we received, communities basically would like us to make sure that the 40% requirement is strictly enforced and for affordable housing to be more affordable, more secure, targeted at local people, older people and key workers, and including a range of tenures, including low cost home ownership. Uh, Whereas you have also developers who would like to see greater flexibility based on viability and including review mechanisms. And also arguing that allocating 
small sites will deliver more affordable housing more quickly than relying on strategic sites. Um, you've then also got the exception sites for affordable housing. So the, pro the proposed approach for this is that where there's an identified need, we would support an exception site that's in an appropriate location and which is proportionate in scale to the settlement it adjoins. And then there would be specific requirements in terms of sites within the green belt. So on this, there was general support for the policy with communities again wanting stronger controls and developers and landowners wanting more flexibility. Next slide, please. So moving on to housing mix, the proposed approach in the first proposal to this is to require new housing of sites, new housing sites of 10 or more dwellings to provide an appropriate mix of housing sizes. So that's based on basically the number of bedrooms within a house. Um, with the proportions guided by the recommendations in our housing needs of specific group study, which is the on the slide, the figures that are shown on the right hand side in the two tables. Um, the proposed approach also includes some flexibility to allow for exceptions where an alternative housing mix is justified by site specific circumstances. So it depends there'll be particular sites that would be difficult to provide exactly these proportions of homes. And we're, we will also encourage a mix of types of homes. So flats, houses, bungalows, etc. On this, there was broad support for seeking a mix of house sizes. Developers would like to see more flexibility to allow for market conditions, changing need and site specific circumstances. Parish councils would like to see us securing more bungalows and the protection of small homes. In terms of housing density, the proposed approach is to seek appropriate site specific densities, taking account of the accessibility of the development, but also the local character. So this means a design led approach will be used to determine the optimum capacity of sites. On this, there's general support from developers for no specified density and making the most of sustainable sites. So as they, that's consistent with the MPPF. Um, there's comments that developments need to be designed to be appropriate for local circumstances. So we need to avoid impact on land or townscape and heritage from all buildings if you're trying to seek too high a density on a particular site. Um, and also, that we need to factor in accessible green space as that's now crucial, especially in high density development. And there is concern from some that high densities will create the slums of tomorrow as poor schemes have been allowed in the past. And if this continues, there's the thought that this will impact on both the quality of life of people living in this area and also the quality of the city. Uh, so um, the policy in relation to garden land and sub subdivision of existing plots, the proposed approach is to continue the approach from the two adopted local plans by resisting inappropriate development of gardens and the subdivision of existing plots. Um, there was general support from a range of public bodies and third sector organisations for this approach. Um, with comments that gardens can mitigate flooding, provide a buffer for e ecology, provide that more rural setting. And, but there's also comments that we need uh, strong wording to prevent detrimental impact on neighbours. Uh, in terms of residential space standards and accessible homes, so this policy would cover kind of three related but slightly different things. So the first part of the policy is um, to continue the proposed, uh, the approach from the adopted local plans to require all new homes to meet 
far exceeds the nationally described residential space standards. So that's the standards that relate to specifying kind of sizes of particular rooms and the overall size of the dwelling in kind of internal measurements. Um, we've then got uh, an ap approach um, requiring all homes to be accessible and uh, adaptable dwellings with specific proportions of dwellings required to meet the M42 and the M43 building regulation standards. So they're the different standards for accessible and adaptable homes. Um, and the third part of this policy would be that um, there's a requirement for all newly created homes to have direct access to private amenity space with specific standards for different types of dwellings and locations. So there's broad support for the use of nationally described space standards, um, but some developers have asked us to provide additional evidence and justification for their use as required by the MPPF. So they don't necessarily consider we've covered off all that we required to just carry that forward. Um, and there's support for the accessible and adaptable home standard um, with some requesting more homes to be delivered to meet the M43 standard, which is the high, kind of higher standard and relates to kind of wheelchair uh, user homes, either designed to meet a, a specific person from the offset or that can be adapted at a later point to meet the requirements of those users. Um, and again, some developers have asked for further evidence to support us applying these standards and don't consider that just having an ageing population is a sufficient justification. Next slide, please. So, specialist housing and homes for older people. This is about specialist housing designed for variety of groups such as older people, disabled people, people with say drug or alcohol dependency or those requiring refuge from violence. Um, so kind of a mixture of kind of specialist housing. And the proposed approach is to require specialist housing to be included within the mix of housing within new developments, particularly new settlements and urban extensions, but then also to include a kind of criteria based policy similar to what is in the adopted Cambridge local plan but applying across the whole of the area that is for kind of individual developments for specialist housing. Uh, and communities have commented that they want housing to be integrated with wider communities and making sure there's better access to services. Um, looking for better choice and design in terms of homes for older people or specialist housing to allow people to downsize or to stay in their own home for longer if desired. And developers want to see specific allocations for these types of homes and a greater choice of sites. And then finally in this section, uh, self and custom build homes. The proposed approach is to require 5% of all new homes on sites of 20 or more dwellings to be custom or self-built homes, provided that we have demand on our custom and self-built register. Um, we would include a mechanism that allows for plots not sold after 12 months of appropriate marketing to be delivered without that requirement. Um, and we set out that where, where it's kind of a wholly self-build or custom-build development, so not just a proportion of a larger scheme, that that would be allowed wherever residential development would normally be allowed. Uh, so there's general support for the policy and the link to need being measured by the register. However, there was concern that the policy will not meet either the quantitative or qualitative needs. So kind of 
people on the register have got specific things that they're looking for and there's concern that our policy wouldn't necessarily provide something that would specifically meet those needs. Um, there's requests for further evidence and justification for our approach. Developers would like a more flexible approach to self and custom build homes that allow schemes on the edge of villages to come forward for these. So they would like to see kind of an exception site policy for self and custom build homes. Um, and then they also, developers also highlight concerns about viability and changing demand. And I believe that's the end of the first section. Does anyone uh, have any questions or comments to make on this first section? Uh, Councillor Porra. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I actually wrote down the questions, so I just go through them all. There's a couple, just get them out there. Yeah. I'll try and be brief. So on the affordable one, this may come up later. Why is it only 20% build to rent? I appreciate we also have that covered off later. So I obviously officers may want to pick that up later instead. Um, and could officers just talk a little bit more about the first homes and the 25% and why we do we have to include that? In, you know, or could we not? I think on the um, garden subdivision, something I've noticed on planning committee is we do give quite a high priority to the biodiversity issues. And I think that came up in the comments. So certainly, I think certainly speaking on behalf of city planning, if Katie agrees, the chair, that's something I personally would think would be useful to make very clear, particularly now that we can go back and look at trees that maybe have been felled before the site comes through, but were there when we kind of took that baseline. Um, for the residential space standards, totally supportive of having a garden space standard because the city currently doesn't. And uh, I think I think your South Cam's policy is very good there. So I would very much support that. Um, I think the other thing that has annoyed me greatly on planning, as I've said before, is we have a space standard for a one person flat. But in effect, they come through all the time with a double bed shown. And as I understand it, there's basically no way of enforcing a one person restriction once it's built. So in effect, we're building a two person flat for 37 square metres. So I'd be really grateful for officers consideration as to whether that is something we can either strengthen or just not have. Because to me, it seems a bit odd that we keep building these 37 metre squares for one person. But I'm reasonably sure that once you rent it, a lot of the plans even have a double bed in there. So that to me seems a bit of a discrepancy in the national space standards, but I don't know whether that's something we can remove. And again, amenity space is always an issue in the city. Um, we've had some issues recently where a redevelopment has come through, where it's a, quite a small part has been redeveloped, like a couple of walls. And there's been an argument, well, we don't need to provide amenity space. I wonder if officers could comment on how we might strengthen that to be clear that you know, even a redevelopment, we would expect amenity space unless, you know, unless it's a grade two listed building with absolutely no space. You know, I would hate us to be in a situation where someone can put in lots of extra flats and no amenity space purely because a bit of it's a redevelopment. And I think currently our local plan isn't as strong on that as it could be. And um, yeah, M43, I just wondered why we don't have market housing included in that. I'm guessing there's a legal reason, but I would certainly like to see that as an aspiration for developers that with market housing, some M43 compliant, you know, disability for those with a permanent long term disability would be useful. Um, and I think last question, I'll get them all done. The self build. When we say custom, I've seen some developers where you can kind of customise your own flat. You know, they'll say if you buy it off plan, you can put two studies or one bedroom. And is that does that count as custom in this policy or are we are we actually being saying that it's genuinely custom? So it wouldn't just be a, a developer wouldn't be able to just say, well, we're offering your choice of a bedroom or a study. That's a custom build. I've finished now. Thank you. Okay. I'll shut up. I, th I think, Jenny, perhaps you could answer those because there's quite a few questions and then we'll go to the other councillors. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so starting with build to rent, although we might come back to that when we've done build to rent, uh, why is it 20% affordable on build to rent development? Uh, partly because that's the kind of national benchmark. Um, it's also partly to do with kind of, I think partly to do with viability because of how, because build to rent developments that kind of operate in a slightly different way because they're not selling off homes in the same way. It's to do with um, what's appropriate to, um, that can be kind of delivered and still secure all the other things that we'd like as well. Um, but there is, there is the potential if we could show something different to secure something different. Um, obviously, we would have to look at, you know, we'd have to do more work to be able to demonstrate that. Um, we have tried to say that if you're developing um, a new site that includes both build to rent and other, other types of homes, so normal market and normal affordable homes, for, I don't quite know how to describe them and differentiate, um, that we'd still be looking for 40% kind of overall. So you'd potentially get more other types of affordable homes to make up that difference. So hopefully that's question one. Uh, first homes and the 25, do we have to provide 25% first homes? Uh, well, it's in a written ministerial statement and therefore, although it might not be in the NPPF at the moment, the advice is, Yes, probably, unless you know something. Unless something changes nationally, then yes, we would have to. And obviously, we're aware that it therefore has implications for what what you've then got left of your forty percent to to provide other types of affordable housing. And so, yeah, there's how you balance that up and still try and secure as much social and affordable rent homes as you can because they're the what our housing team are telling us are the ones that are uh, most needed. Uh, gardens, I think you were just commenting rather than asking a question. Uh, residential space standards and the one person flat, uh, I'd have to, we'd have to have a look at that and see what we can do. I don't know that we've got an answer now. Shaking I think with the national space standards, I think the issue is that we effectively take on using the national standards rather than create our own. So uh, unless, unless things change, the approach previously has been that you either use the national standards or you don't. They're not necessarily our gift to edit. But of course, you know, this all depends on, on future policy. But that was why we took that position in the current plans. Sorry, Jenny, you carry on. Uh, we'll we'll love to have a look at your comment about um, amenity space standards for kind of non wholly new developments. I think is what you were asking, like when there's kind of a conversion or those kind of things. Uh, so yeah, but obviously they're potentially more difficult to provide exactly a specific space and like a specific amount of space if you're converting something that's already there. But yes, um, take your point that you'd still want them to have private amenity space. So we will look to see what we can do to uh, take that. Um, the M43 standards and whether we can have a market requirement. Um, I think, yes, we need to, we'll, we'll need to re-look at it. We ended up where we did because we went round in kind of various thought processes. Um, 
but yes, I think there are other comments within the comments we've received, so we will need to kind of go back through our thought process and see whether we can do something different. Um, I think part of it to do with exactly which part of M43, the A or B or that it comes to, because one's to do with kind of having a specific person in mind for the house when you build it, which is obviously more difficult to do for a market home than for an affordable home where you potentially have someone in mind earlier on in the process. But yeah, we'll have, we can have a look. Uh, the self and custom build question in terms of does offering studies and bedrooms. I think it, I think we're, it's required, it's supposed to be more than that. It's supposed to be like people having an actual, their first occupier having an actual say in the design of something. Although obviously in flattered developments and certain high density developments etc you've got less scope for what you can do because obviously you've got the outline of a flat and therefore you, it's there's maybe a kind of finer point as to where something is kind of custom build custom I think there's this I think in the northeast Cambridge area action plan we ended up referring to things as kind of custom finish which is like a kind of subsection of custom build, but takes account of the kind of high density nature and the ability people would have to be able to input. I think that's all your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Um, the, the order of the next, the councillors is, uh, I'll just the Bachelor, Williams, Sandford, and then Smith. So, Councillor Bachelor, please. Thank you. As the oldest hand, I'll take that. Thank you. Um, so, just just two questions from me then. Um, firstly, just going back to the first homes issue. I mean, I was I might be wrong, but I was under the impression that the uh, the developer or the builder actually building the development out would need to apply for to for the first homes scheme, or there was something that didn't make it as attractive as a scheme. Uh, to developers. I mean, I, th I thought there, there must have been a reason why we don't have that many in, in Greater Cambridge. Um, but yeah, just, just some clarity on that would be helpful from my point of view. Uh, and then second one, on the exception sites. Um, yeah, I appreciate the policy is currently it needs, um, the demand is led from a needs assessment locally. Is there any is there anything in the policy around how recent the needs assessment would need to be? Because I know we have had situations where needs assessments have been put forward that's, you know, sort of five, six, seven years uh, in the past prior to application. So, yeah, I just wanted to question if there's anything in the um, in the policy around um, time frame for that needs assessment having been undertaken. That's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. We'll have um, Councillor Williams. Have you got a couple of questions as well? And then Jenny can answer both Councillor Bachelors and yours. Yeah, sure. I've just got two. Um, so um, I'll try to keep keep them brief. Um, just a question on the um, housing mix. I was wondering if any work has been done about the impact of the percentages on market housing. Because one thing that struck me about, about our proposed figures is that the percentage of one and two bed market houses is much lower than the percentage of one and two bed affordable houses. So it's 15 to 25 percent market two bed but for two beds it's 35 to 45 affordable um ownership and then 35 to 40 affordable rented so you know it's a slight concern i think is that the number of smaller starter homes going on the market is 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 is, is limited so people have limited opportunities to buy them because developers are mostly building three and four bed which are much more expensive um so have we done any sort of analysis of, of the impact of these these percentages on that that flow of, of, of start homes to the market? Because that's an important, you know, step for people to get on the housing ladder. That's how I started out with a with a small two bed house. Um, I slightly worry these days that 
Um, we're not really building enough of those. But um, anyway, so so I'd be interested in the, in the sort of thinking and the research behind that. Um, the other point I wanted to make is about um, densities. I, I probably do have to register a slight objection. I don't really like the I don't support the density policy because, of course, in South Cams at the moment, we've already we've got a different policy. We have um, densities for different you know, um, types of villages. And we're, I think, essentially proposing to get rid of that for the new plan, the, the guidelines we've currently got for, you know, minor rural centres, et cetera, et cetera, um, group villages, and have this design-led approach. And, and I do worry that a design-led approach is, is really a bit of a free-for-all because it becomes very, very subjective um, as to what the developer, you know, manages to convince the planning department is appropriate. Um, and obviously developers have got a vested interest in putting more and more houses on the same land, um, which might be appropriate in some cases, but it's often not appropriate in a in, in a village. And if we've got rid of any sort of standard, it's very difficult to um, to actually oppose what could be inappropriately dense um, developments in, in village settings. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Could you answer those four questions? Thanks. So going back to Councillor Batchelor's first question about first homes. How the written ministerial statement and the guidance is worded at the moment means that we are not actively seeking first homes at the moment because they're not in a requirement of our current adopted local plans and therefore that's why there's not many potentially coming forward um equally like you said they're a form of affordable home but they don't get handed over to a housing association to kind of manage the process of letting them kind of selling them kind of doing that side of things they are um the house builder themselves has to kind of carry out that process with the support of the local planning authority doing various things so i think in terms of their attractiveness to developers they're not hugely attractive to them because they require them to do additional kind of work rather than just selling and market home which is what they're used to doing or kind of handing over affordable homes to someone else to kind of go through the processes for i don't know whether that hopefully answers the question yeah it does. I, know, I knew there was there was some reason why it was less attractive to build you know to allocate first homes as it was to you know, to general affordable units, but thank you for that. Uh, exception site and the needs assessment. Uh, I don't know that we specifically say a requirement in our current policies. Uh, colleagues are suggesting it's they should be within the last five years, but yeah. we would need to work out whether we can go as far as. Jenny, that's actually yes. that, that the housing team uh, specify five years when they're looking okay. on exception sites. It's not a planning policy, but it's what the housing team at South Cam's District Council require. So, but whether we whether we can actually put it in a policy in a plan, we'd need to think about that. How's it? So, Councillor Williams' question about housing mix and the impact. On of the proposed proportions of different types of homes. So we've been guided by the housing needs of specific group study that's been done for us by GL Hearn on behalf of us and a range of other local authorities. So I don't have the exact wording in, in my head of what that evidence-based study says, but so we'd have to kind of go away and look and see 
whether that gave us any indication as to what they thought, whether that gave us any further information in terms of why they thought a smaller proportion of market smaller homes than affordable smaller homes. I don't, I don't, unless John's got any thoughts, I don't have any immediate thoughts. Well, they did explore, I think, the, the needs relating to different tenures. So I suspect the answer does come from that there's perhaps more of a need for those those family homes in, I think, the affordable and the more smaller homes in the other. So I suspect it is um, explored through that evidence. Quite happy to take that away and make sure that's, re that's a point that we uh, look into uh, as we're drafting the plan and we respond to those issues. But I suspect our aim has been that that evidence base that we've secured working with the housing department and so on does give us you know appropriate steer as to what those needs you know actually are to make sure we're aiming that policy correctly Stephen do you want to come in on that or after Jenny finishes the last the next question which was about um, Dr Williams's question about density so there's one more question Jenny Jenny, Jenny, if you answer that, I, I might have a comment on that, but I'll, I, I'm, uh, I thought I might comment on the previous discussion as well, but that's fine. Um, well, that was more, that's possibly less of a question and more of a comment, I would have said, in terms of density, um, in understanding, yeah, what, how we create a policy that gives enough gives enough comfort that developments will come forward that are the right density in the right locations um, without, with, by, while also taking the design-led approach, which is more what the MPPF is seeking these days rather than a specific policy requirement for particular densities in particular locations. Uh, Councillor Williams. All right, thanks. Yeah, I mean, on, on, that, on that last point, it, it is, I suppose, if I'm formulating a more direct question for you, it is what, what protections will there be um, for us to be able to, you know, resist um, inappropriately dense um, um, and I, I, there did seem to be a lack of real world data in there. It was all modelling projected population growth and all of that. But I mean, if you were able to sort of take it away and maybe come come back to me on that, that 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 would be be quite handy. But um, I must admit the modelling didn't didn't fill me with confidence that it would translate into the real world. Thank you, um, Stephen Kelly. Do you, do you want to come in? It's just a, a a couple of comments, I suppose, is is that uh, and and Councillor Williams' uh, point around how do we get safeguards in place? Obviously, neighbourhood planning is is one such mechanism that can um, provide a bit more contextually specific um, appraisals of uh, of of character and 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 so on, and and to bake that into development plan policy. I think the practical implications of trying to come up with a um, justifiable density um, uh, figure, for example, would probably involve you having to actually review most settlements in order that you could relate it back to their character in order to be able to justify to a planning inspector that it was uh, um, appropriate to fix density rather than to rely, as Jenny's referred to, on NPPF um, and, a, and, a, and a design-led approach, which is what um, generally policies are, are heading towards. Um, but I think I, I think um, certainly is an important point about how do you get local distinctiveness, which in turn is about uh, empathy and appropriate um, development forms in in those locations. I think that is something that um, we're hoping to um, explore as we progress forward in the short term that may well be able to translate into some finesse in, a, in our policies. And Chair, I know that you're particularly passionate about context in terms of um, the proper appreciation of, of um, the design process. Uh, in terms of the point around housing, the only observation I wanted to make is that one of the things in, in some respects that we've faced is that 
housing policy moves faster than the eight year local plan process. Uh, and so there is something around as we go forward, how we can keep our housing policy contemporary and how the planning, uh, the, the development plan can make um, give significant weight to that, but allow members to um, evolve the planning policy response on any particular application with that, those kind of contemporary products and also ways of thinking um, that might require a greater de degree of agility as we go forward than perhaps the kind of eight year process for the local plan. So there is a there is a balance here around how our joint housing strategy, picking up on, on Councillor Williams' concerns around uh, an, a potential imbalance, but also um, uh, Councillor Bachelor's comments in terms of um, the, the the consideration of, of of how we can best meet the needs of our uh, of our community. That that I would urge, we don't want too prescriptive a policy in the plan. What we want is to make sure that the policy references and gives substance to things like our housing strategy, which are of course locally controllable, as opposed to being subject to examination and um, approval through the local plan process. But, but I think the points are all made, well made. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so have uh, Councillor Sanford and then Councillor Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I was actually going to comment on the uh, linkage between density and the slums of tomorrow. Um, I think Mr Kelly made the point that it's very difficult to have one size fits all policy in a um, varied a county as Cambridge here and what is appropriate in Eddington for example would be totally inappropriate in um, Whittlesford so um, definitely some flexibility needed there um, I also had a question if we monitor um, whether we're providing sufficient specialist housing for example for wheelchair users um, there was a development here in Papworth a few years ago where the Papworth Trust sold off land which previously accommodated bungalows for those with special needs. They were all de demolished and guess what? They've been replaced with high end, mostly detached housing. I have no idea where the residents went, so whether we are providing sufficient specialist housing for them. Perhaps uh, one of the officers can answer that question. Thank you. Councillor Smith. So I just wanted to pick up the point on build to rent. Um, this is described as introduced by the government as a new asset class, uh, not homeless for people to live, a new asset class with a view to government introducing new forms of sources of finance into the construction the house building industry and to meet a identified housing need in the private rented sector. Uh, uh, the 40% contribution towards, the, and it's in, incentivized by this relaxation of the affordable housing requirement. Um, and it's, it is now um, widely known in the market is, is a hot investment uh, item, this new asset class. So I wouldn't be too distracted by uh, narratives as to suggesting there are viability issues with it. Uh, far from it, um, but it has to be judged in in the form of asset that it is, which is a 15 year rental stream plus capital appreciation. Um, and at the end of that period, the whole thing can be put onto the market and and and, and sold off if the investor so 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 requires. So what I'm concerned about in this is that we don't set 20 percent as uh, the the target, the the the, the minimum. The guidance is very clear that it's open to local negotiation for more than 20%. And in the market of Greater, in Greater Cambridge, I think we should be able to negotiate that. And, and a final point on build to rent is that when it comes to the um, discount to market, it should be discount to market rent, not discount to market rent and service charge, because in the wider market, Landlords uh, only charge the rent; they pick up the service charge costs. Don't, so don't let the developers confuse us as to what the actual discount 
um, is. The, uh, I've got one more point. Well, two more points, well, a very quick one, which is on when it's in the social affordable housing mix, um, and we know the demand is there for one and two bedroom properties. I don't think we should have them all in apartments. There should be two bedroom houses so that people who are in the social rented sector do have access to their own front door, their own back door and uh, a, a garden. So there'll be lifetime tenants with families. And I think that is the decent thing to do for people who are in the lower end of the housing, find themselves in the lower end of the housing housing market. And there should be that option and uh, that that choice. And just picking up on um, Councillor Williams's point um, about that housing mix, I think he's actually making a good point because what the diamond analysis um, says, and, and, and uh, Stephen Kelly can tell us a bit more about this if people aren't familiar with it, which I think is a very detailed analysis of the housing need in, in, in Greater Cambridgeshire, is that we've got, say, generalised the right three categories. We've got the, the social affordable housing needs and at, the, and then at the top end of the market, we've got the four bed exec homes, which the private sector love the most, and then the mid market. And it's perhaps the people who are in the lower end of the mid market who are facing between that choice of going into uh, private rented or finding these starter homes, these small, smaller dwellings. And it's therefore, and there is a shortage in that market in, in, in from my reading of the analysis. And I think we need to re-look re at that as Councillor Williams was suggesting, because I think it needs to be, it'd be a strong supply to enable people to uh, own their own home and become owner occupiers. And if they're fortunate enough to stir case into a bigger into a bigger home, if, if that's what they wish, wish, wish to do. So I think that does need looking at again. That's all, thank you. Can I just follow on from that last point from Councillor Smith is, is um, the, there's also a need for retired people to downsize, I think particularly in the villages as well. They, they want to stay in their communities and uh, as Councillor Williams pointed out, their the developers tend to build larger homes and there's definitely a need for the smaller homes in villages. So um, Jenny, could you pick up those? Thank you. Sorry, Chair, we have a request from our Dem Services colleague. If we can just pause proceedings for a second. OK. Yeah, please do continue. Thank you for your patience. OK. Jenny, would you like to answer those questions? Thanks. So from Councillor Sandford, in terms of uh, wheelchair user dwellings and whether we monitor specialist housing of that sort, um, we, mon we monitor the, in terms of like the authority mon uh, monitoring report that we publish every year, we um we monitor what the current adopted policy is requiring so we kind of look at whether new homes that are permitted since the adoption of the plan are meeting the requirements um so we possibly so we wouldn't necessarily be picking up that homes of that kind of standard of being lost because we're looking at new homes rather than kind of homes that have been lost. Does that make sense? Um, in terms of Councillor Smith's point, were there any were there any questions, specific questions, or were they just comments? Sorry if I missed an uh, I think there were comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I've I've got um a question. Um 
we have a section on we we get planning applications for uh, send genuine um, classification for accommodation which sort of apart hotels and they don't a lot of the housing policies don't seem to cover those is it possible that we can include policies to cover space standards accessibility and amenity spaces for apart hotels or anything else that may come through that we don't know about at the moment um i think one of the app planning committees recently we thought the and for an apart hotel we were asking whether the um building regs mobility standards m5 which was for commercial buildings because this wasn't these were we were told this wasn't really residential but this kind of residential but it's a commercial development whether that could apply so i think the we don't know what's coming but under this section can we ask that housing policies apply and finally does anybody else want to come back in on um any final questions or and i know we have hillary cox condren has has joined us um and as we wrap up this section if anyone else Hilary, if you wanted to come in, you you can as well. Oh, thank you. I really have come in at, at the end of that. So excuse me that I was just going to add to some questions about. Um, I just wondered about homes for life and I don't know much about them at all, except that somebody was uh, a resident was asking me about them recently trying to find one. So a home that can be adapted. I'm sure that you know what it is and I didn't. A home that can be adapted as you get older and space to be able to. Um, yeah, be able to adapt it as your needs change. I wondered if that was. I think it's capable. Thank you. OK, Jenny. So in answer to your question, I think we'd have to look into what we can. Specifically require in terms of the various homes policies or the various. Uh, slightly different housing uses uh, in the first proposals, it does. Already try to say things like affordable housing where it the types of housing it wouldn't necessarily apply to like caravan sites or kind of certain sites where you wouldn't necessarily be able to provide affordable housing in quite the same way so you know kind of I think we need to take away that thought in terms of whether kind of a part hotel it, what of our housing policies could we realistically apply to things like a part hotel. Uh, in terms of Councillor Cox Condon, homes for life, what we were talking about, and I don't know whether you thought this bit, in terms of um, there's building regulation standards now for accessible and adaptable homes that effectively do the same thing as what might previously be called homes for life so they're about making sure that um homes are designed so that they can kind of be used accessible accessibly by different kind of users with different needs but equally there are some that can be kind of have the ability to be further adapted at a later point easily That's kind of, it. so kind of having the whatever whatever's required for a lift to be put in at some later point and by having the right kind of frame in your building such that you can just slot it in at a later point rather than having to completely demolish kind of yeah thank exactly exactly that so apologies everybody that you so, don't yes there are uh, proposals <laughs> to require certain <laughs> amounts of different types of homes to meet that thank you yep. So that's all all new homes in the next local plan will be adaptable. Uh, we will meet some kind of accessible yes. or adaptable yeah. standard with some meeting higher kind yeah. of higher levels. Okay. So we finished this section. So the the next section is another one on housing, and then the third section will be well being and social inclusion. So if we could go on to the next housing section, thanks. OK, that's myself. I'm Mark Dees. I work with Jenny on the housing side. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is um, built to rent uh, again. Um, so alongside the, the general references 
with regard to affordable housing, we're also proposing a specific policy on uh, build to rent, uh, which will set out the conditions whereby we would be looking to allow uh, build to rent uh, with a particular focus on trying to avoid um, over concentration of the tenure in uh, specific local areas. And as has already been mentioned, we would be looking at 20% affordable private rent as a minimum uh, within these schemes. Generally, there was um, support for the, the overall approach uh, based, I think, on recognition that they do form part of the housing mix and have a role to play in um, addressing housing need and providing choice. Um, but developers had two specific concerns with what we were proposing. Um, the first one was um, objecting to any kind of restriction or limit on the amount of bill to rent that would be allowed within a development. And their second concern was that they wanted more flexibility um, to address viability and local circumstance issues. Next policy, um, homes and multiple occupation. Um, so again, we've set out an approach where we are really looking forward, uh, proposing to bring forward the criteria based policy that we've already got in the adopted Cambridge local plan, um, but apply it to the whole of Greater Cambridge. Um, we actually had very few responses on this policy, although despite that, there was still no real consensus from the comments that, that we did get. Um, there was a recognition from some that HMOs do make contribution uh, to the housing mix, although there were some concerns about addressing quality of the HMOs. Um, but there was a, a kind of alternative view, which was that um, HMOs can have a very negative effect on the character and social cohesion of neighbourhoods that we need to be beware of. Um, can we go on to the next slide, John? Bruce is going to Thank talk you. to our students. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the, 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 the proposed policy approach um, for student accommodation um, support, which we consulted upon in the first proposals, um, supported the identified growth for student accommodation over the next 10 years. Um, it would support new purpose built student accommodation, which would reduce the need for private accommodation. Existing student accommodation would continue to be protected and student accommodation uh, will be counted towards overall housing need. Um, there was general support for the policy um, in terms of its location for new student accommodation. Site promoters requested the city centre be treated as a suitable, appropriate location for new student accommodation. Uh, the University of Cambridge did raise the issue about counting self-contained student accommodation um, towards housing, overall housing requirements. Uh, and Anglia Ruskin considered policy approach uh, unduly restrictive um, towards individual sites requiring or uh, required to remain in general current residential or student use despite both contributing towards overall housing requirements. Uh, next slide, uh, thank you John. You're on mute Mark. Sorry. Um, yeah, again, we are looking to um, carry forward um, an approach that we had in the South Cambridge adopted local plan here. Um, so it's all about um, the conditions um, that we or the criteria we would use in assessing whether uh, dwellings outside of village frameworks would be allowed. Um, and it actually covers a number of different issues. So uh, we would be looking at uh, replacement dwellings, extensions to dwellings, uh, the reuse of buildings for residential use, um, dwellings to support rural businesses and dwellings of exceptional quality and that each um, type would have its own criteria. Um, there was again general support for the approach. Um, some parish councils did suggest ways in which we could tighten up um, some of the criteria that we would use um, and Historic England did have some concerns over uh, reuse of buildings in the countryside and the need to consider the historic environment and heritage assets. And you'll see the, uh, the middle bullet point there. We did have a specific point come in from an architectural practice 
um, around some technical wording changes they were seeking in the light of um, permitted development rights, which I think we'll have to go away and look at in a bit more detail. Uh, next one, please, John. So uh, residential moorings. Um, this one, we are looking to carry forward the um, current criteria based approach in the Cambridge local plan, but apply it to the whole of Great Cambridge. Uh, there were very few comments uh, on this one. Um, there were some comments from the Cambridge and South Cambridge Green Parties about uh, need for um, better engagement and trying to provide more appropriate facilities with any moorings that do come forward. They had some concerns about quality of um, some existing moorings, I think. Uh, and then on residential caravan sites, um, again, the, the approach will attempt to set out the criteria we would use in assessing um, sites suitability for caravan use. Um, relative few comments, the Environment Agency did highlight the importance of addressing flood risk here because of the vulnerability of caravans to uh, flood threats. And we had some specific comments from the Cambridge Gypsy and Romany Traveller Solidarity Network and the Cambridge and South Cam's Green Parties raised concerns regarding the sufficient provision of sites and the effective assessment of need. Um, although I think looking at those comments, it would appear I think they were more focused on um, Gypsy and Traveller sites rather than caravan sites more generally, although they, they did put their comments against this specific policy. Um, John, next slide, please. So on the Gypsy and Traveller and Show People sites, um, we will uh, set out again criteria for uh, how we will assess these sites. It will also be based on the Gypsy and Traveller accommodation needs assessment, which will inform us as to um, how many sites we need, we, we think we need to be planning for. Um, there have been some problems with our study, so we still don't have an up-to-date assessment of need. Um, in terms of the comments that we got, uh, there was, I think, generally a recognition that we do need to allocate a range of sites to address the housing need. I think there seemed to be little doubt that there would be some need when the, the study was finally published. Um, criticism that the current policies weren't working as, as they have delivered too few sites. Um, a sense that the sites needed to be of good quality with adequate access to services and facilities. So it's not just about identifying you know, any old piece of land we can find, um, they've got, got to be suitable sites. Um, and interestingly, um, there was only one developer um, flagged any concerns about our proposal to potentially seek provision uh, of Gypsy and Traveller sites within some of the major sites that are coming forward. And the last policy is community-led housing, where again, we will look to set out um, where we think community-led housing schemes would, would be applicable and the criteria we would use for assessing them. Um, there was general support um, for specific policy on community-led housing, but it was stressed that it should be seen as a broader a part of a broader package of affordable housing options. Um, and there were a couple of comments about the relationship between community-led housing and exception sites. One saying that uh, community-led housing should be the preferred method of delivering exception sites and somebody else taking a kind of counter view that um, yes, community-led housing is fine as long as it doesn't get in the way of delivering rural exception sites. Um, so that's a quick run through the policies. Um, thank you both uh, for those for that. Um, so some of the com some of the questions and comments from the first section are actually relevant to this one. So councillors, please don't re-ask questions, but officers, please note the relevant questions from the previous section. So councillors, any discussion here? Simon, Councillor Smith, you've still got your hand up. Do you want to come in first, and then Councillor Williams, and then Councillor Porra? Oh, okay. Councillor Williams first, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's just two points. Actually, the first one I better mention, um, I work for the university, so I probably ought to declare an interest there, given that the university has come up. Um, uh, although my point is not, not really relevant to that. I, I, otherwise, I just had a very short point um, about the um, feedback from parish councils about requiring rural developments to be um, next door to existing villages and not self-contained 
annexes. I think that's a very good point, a very important point. Um, I, mean, I think we know, you know, in, in a village setting, they're not sustainable in the sense of uh, being in the middle of a city, but putting a de development outside a, a village makes it even more unsustainable in terms of uh, it, it makes people entirely reliant on um, on cars, for example. Um, so um, I, I, I think that that's a very important point and I, I would like to see that that taken forward. Uh, Councillor Porra, and then we can have the questions from those two. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Chair. Um, talking of the bill to rent, obviously I raised the 20%, but I, and I think the other thing, we're going for 15 years covenant. I must admit, and it always says we're going to seek more. That worries me. I would rather we started with the higher level and then it was very much on the developers to negotiate down from that. Because it, in my fairly limited experience for three or four years, it is very rare that we are successful in seeking higher. So my view for both the build to rent percentage and the tenure is I think we should, well, our policies should ask for more because I do think we can evidence that from the demand. And, you know, we have a lot of developments that build to rent coming through. We can see certainly in the city. Um, for the HMOs, definitely welcome the space standards. Um, I think I would like to raise the Airbnb and other provider issue. Because obviously there's an HMO definition about you know people from multiple households, but certainly in the city, and I'm guessing from the comments in South Cams as well, there's an issue of multiple occupation being repeated, different families staying, which is, in my opinion, quite detrimental to the housing stock. And we currently don't really have any controls on this. I mean, one option would be a condition for new builds or conversions to have some kind of, in effect, permitted development rights removed, so they'd have to come through planning. Or whether we could look at something like London, Sadiq Khan's done, where there's a limit to the number of days you can rent a full house out before it has to be require a change of use permission. Because certainly for me, that is quite an issue. It's in because for these smaller houses with fewer than the sui generis definition, there is no control at the moment. And whilst I respect if people want to have Airbnb, that's fine and rent out your spare room. Or rent out your house but we do need to have some control about the comings and goings and the extra demands that puts as well as the issues for our housing stock so i'd welcome advice on that um i should declare as well i work for aru i noticed they've made a comment but um i've i'm not being involved in that at all it's not my area of work but just to make that declaration to be clear for the student accommodation can we be clear that when we talk about this we mean students We've had a couple, well, one that came to our city planning recently where there were a considerable number of staff houses which were counted or advised by our planning policy team that these counted as student. So there was no sort of S106 obligations, no school contributions. So I would like us just to be very clear that this is student accommodation. And I'd quite like a definition of students, i.e. postgraduate taught and research, because obviously once we get towards postdocs and things like that, I personally think most cases they would need to be accommodated within our normal policies so i would be grateful if officers might consider that and finally the grt um policy gypsy roma traveler it's a shame we haven't got the assessment of needs so i would welcome the chance to review that once we do have it because certainly we're not providing enough sites and there's certainly a real issue around the biomed campus people wanting to visit the hospitals when they've got relatives there which is obviously there is nothing near there so understandably, this can lead to some conflicts with people needing to stay near there, but nowhere to park. So I just I would wonder if the chair or someone might consider that we could review that when we have the Jatana results, because I think that is really important. Thank you. So we'll have if the officers could answer those questions before we go on. Thanks. Oh, OK, Bruce, was there anything you want to say in the student accommodation? Uh, Yes, so um, <coughs> in terms of um, we are seeing now some of the colleges needing academic staff accommodation um, and we've only had a couple of examples of this. So as part of our engagement with universities, colleges, we will be bottoming out what their actual needs are and the local plan should help cover this off. Um, normally, they like the academic staff to actually use the accommodation for students. 
So uh, and at the moment we do restrict the access, the the use of it through Section 106. So it can't be treated as a residential. Um, but I admit we perhaps need to have a bit more detail in the local plan. Equally, we are now seeing a lot more demand for postgraduate accommodation. And again, we will be trying to firm up the needs of the universities, the colleges, and actually what that means and whether that actually includes postgraduates with families and et cetera. So um, that is something we will be taking, I will be taking up with the university to try and flesh out. That, that's all I've got on the mark on the, accommodate, oh, the student accommodation. Okay, Thank you. thanks Bruce. Um, I think most of the rest were more comments and questions, but if I can just pick up on a, a couple of points. Um, I think the point about the, the bill to rent and the um, minimum 20% uh, should be affordable. I think it's a good point. I mean, it's clearly going to be up for discussion for a while yet, I think, to try and work through how, how we're going to deal with that. But I think um, Councillor Smith made a really important point earlier when he talked about um, the level of discount as well, because actually I think a lot of people would say a 20% discount on market houses in Cambridge is not particularly affordable. And I think there is a concern that we've maybe got a trade-off here in that if we negotiate higher proportions of affordable housing within the schemes, is that going to affect the the level of affordability? So more affordable might mean lower discounts, a lower proportion of affordable might mean you can negotiate a high discount on each one. So yeah, I think there may be a trade-off we'll have to look at, but yeah, I haven't got an answer for you now. But yes, I mean, I think point noted. Um, the other thing I'll just comment on very briefly, you talked about um, HMOs and the, the use of Airbnbs. I think that is a really good point. It's not something I've got you an answer on, but it's something I think quite like to go away and, and have a think about because um, I, I don't know how, how we do deal with that, but I do I do recognise the issue. Can I step, it, step in on that one, Mark, mm. because we have got a policy uh, in the job section on visitor accommodation, and that certainly picks up um, the type of accommodation where planning permission is required. And I think that that's part of the issue. We can obviously control through the local plan the issues that require permission and that policy approach, which will come to a, a future session coming your way, um, does very much look at what criteria should apply to that type of um, application. So it's not a forgotten issue, but there's a limit to what we can do. Is that, I think, I think that's covered your points. I just want to add one point to what uh, Councillor Porra said about the student accommodation is that Sometimes we found on a recent application that the accommodation was going to be used more of the time as a as um, conferencing accommodation. So it was only it was submitted as student accommodation, but it was going to be used for like 52 percent of the time as conferencing accommodation. And I, we felt that that actually should be recognised in the application and it's commercial accommodation rather than student. So normally that would. Um, be controlled through the section 106 cascade and perhaps that's something um, we can I can have a chat with DM about refining that cascade um, to the I think, high percentage I, I'm, I think the concern was it it was uh, leads to is it uh, student accommodation doesn't pay business rates but uh, conferencing accommodation could so is that that it was a concern about that I can so, pick that up with our yeah. development management colleagues. Yeah, so um, I'm going to ask Councillor Shaler next as he's a member of the committee and then followed up with Councillor Poxcondron. Hello, <clears throat> it's um, I've got a question about um, some non-standard housing need that we, we see around the city. But first, about density, I do a sort of, sort of a thought experiment sometimes when I think about how big a building would you need to accommodate everybody in Cambridge in a single building? And it, you know, it's about, you know, connecting people and all sorts of stuff. So this is probably something about the next section. But the, and so sometimes this idea of density and absolute density, it depends what that provides, you know, what kind of a quality of life you, you get from that provision. But the, the question I have is about people who are living on narrow boats, but also in, um, vans and and mobile homes and that sort of stuff while we are uh, getting about canvassing we quite often find people and th this is obviously providing a housing need some of them are working in in nhs and and various other ways 
do we have to think about providing um, uh, better places for for these people as well? Thank you. Um, um, Councillor Cox Condren, do you want to come in now? Thank you very much. I think that, well, no, not a think. I know that I'm just sort of um, adding to the conversation rather than asking a question here, um, which was about the Gypsy Roma Traveller and Showman sites and just um, just saying really that in my role at County um, as Vice Chair of um, Community Social Mobility and Inclusion, you, you know, you mentioned the adequate services and facilities and just stressing how, um, you know, keen we are to work collaboratively to ensure that that's being delivered well in everywhere obviously but um you know really keen to, to support that thank you thank you yes. officers okay, yeah can i just pick up um councillor shaler's um comment about the different types of need the um it's called, it's called the Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Needs Assessment, but it's actually a little bit broader than that, and it will actually cover uh, residential moorings, uh, residential caravans, travelling show people, and Gypsy and Travellers. So it will be addressing different types of need. I don't think you talked about, was it? I'm not sure if you mentioned any, are there any other specific needs that you'd got in mind? Um, but there's kind of four groups there that the, the study will try and address. Yeah, the, <clears throat> some of these, you know, there's different levels of mobility. Some of them are really vans. And then, you know, the whole idea of density of housing goes out the window, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And and um, but they need access to other facilities and, and space and other residents uh, are worried about the, the the parking provision and, you know, all of those various other problems. Yeah, I mean, certainly <clears throat> with, with regard to those different types of need, they will have specific policies and criteria for assessing the sites. So for example, gypsy and traveller sites are very low density um, and, tra and travelling show people sites are even lower density because they have to have space to accommodate their, you know, their attractions and things that they, they take around with them. So there are specific um, criteria for those. Um, yeah. okay. So what, what are the issues we do need to pick up as we move toward draft plan is um, how we deal with the need for Gibson Traveller and, and other caravan um, accommodation. Um, the, there has been delays to the, the needs study, but we are expecting to be able to get an up-to-date study. And we need to think about um, how we meet that. The need, the, the uh, first proposal set out some criteria about how we might look at meeting that need, and that included looking for major developments, but also what sort of criteria we might apply. Um, in finding sites elsewhere, and we'll need to look at um, various sources of land as to how we identify that need, which you know, it's likely to be a challenging issue, but we are very much still uh, aware of the need to address that issue as we go forward. I'm very much aware of the need, picking up on the points raised in the representations uh, for that needs assessment work to en engage uh, with the relevant communities and make sure they have the chance to influence that work. So. It, it's very much still a very live and important issue for the plan. So, Jonathan, would that also include um, the accommodation for homeless people that's been identified, and certainly in Cambridge City, with the the transition homes that are being provided? Uh, I, I don't believe it would pick up that issue specifically, but I guess to reassure more generally, we re work really closely with the housing teams regarding uh, the development of these policies uh, and including um, working with them as they develop updates to the housing strategy. So we'll make sure that we pick up all the policy areas, um, you know, that they think we need to cover in the plan, but I'm not, not okay. sure that it specifically picks up that one. Okay, thank you. I think we finished the, uh, the two housing sections and we're about to start the wellbeing and social inclusion. Does anybody need a small break? Otherwise, we'll move straight on. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm conscious of time. Oh, yeah. Did anybody want to cover the next steps for housing? I think John's covered some of them already. That's OK, bye. Brief. OK. Uh, gypsy and Traveller stuff, and basically it just sets out that we know we need to work out the fully formed versions of all the policies, look at whether there's anything 
new up to date in terms of evidence? Have things changed in terms of national policy, etc.? But I won't go on for any longer than that. I'll let you move on to the next. Yeah. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so um, I'm, I'm just I'm going to uh, prevent, pre present the first two policies. Then I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Joanna Davis, who will then hand over to my colleague, uh, Lizzie Wood. So if we could um, go to the next slide, John. I'll start off with the first policy, um, creating healthy new developments, key issues raised. So just to summarise, uh, in the first proposals, um, this policy Uh, the intention is to integrate um, health considerations in the policies across the local plan, uh, such as requiring health impact assessments uh, uh, to accompany planning applications and um, to require healthy principles to be applied to new developments um, and also explore policies to restrict new local, uh, new hot food takeaway premises close to schools and leisure centres. Uh, and limit the concentration of such premises uh, in urban and rural centres. Um, for this policy, there was general support uh, with some comments explaining how policy should maximise well-being. Um, some suggested the HIAs, the uh, health impact assessments, should only apply to major developments. Um, uh, Natural England suggested including links to accessible uh, green infrastructure. Uh, while the Cambridge cycling campaign supported the provision of integrated infrastructure. Uh, the Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire um, Green Party supported interventions on takeaways uh, in low income communities involved with local businesses and producing healthy foods. I appreciate this. Um, next slide, please, John. OK, uh, and the second policy uh, I'm presenting um, is the policy covering community sports and leisure facilities. Uh, uh, in new developments. Um, so the objective of this policy um, to set up in the first proposals we, we proposed um, sets out um, what new community facilities, including cultural education and leisure facilities should be provided along with health care and, and sports um, to be provided through a new development. Uh, and the, the, the policy proposed will require appropriate community, cultural, educational, sports, leisure provision to meet the needs um, generated by new developments. Um, reviewing, um, so the policy, as you can see, there are quite a few responses to this. It's generally well supported. Um, however, there were points, particularly on specific sports facilities, uh, such as support for a new public swimming pool, uh, including cycling within cycling distance of communities and existing provision is at capacity. Uh, Sport England requested their active design to be referenced in their policy. Um, there were a couple of also specific requests from the Cambridge Futsal Club with the support of the Cambridge Handball Club um, about the um, lack of a venue for that to support provision to host national indoor sports events. Um, it, uh, the skate park um, representations uh, requested more well lit covered skate park areas so that it could be used throughout the year. Um, some some promoters noted the need for a policy to set out how the new facilities will be sustained through new development. So it's not just the completion of the, the new facility, but how they'll be perhaps looked after. And there's also clarification from um, site promoters about what is deemed appropriate and the thresholds for contributions and whether they should be on and off site. Um, also, um, the education um, department at the county council um, did raise safeguarding concerns with facilities within schools used by members of the public. Um, so <clears throat> we need to consider how the access and management of these facilities for new facilities can be can be um, can be taken forward if they are to be dual use facilities. And uh, the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Clinical Commissioning Group requested policies to support plans of local health commissioners and provision of health facilities to meet population needs. I'll now hand over to my colleague Joanna to cover the next two policies. Thank you. Um, so the um, meanwhile uses during long term redevelopment policy um, would seek temporary uses on vacant sites and in underused buildings on major sites that are in the early stages of development before 
um, their permanent uses have been implemented. It would also potentially cover um, existing built buildings such as um, vacant shop units where there isn't uh, uh, an imminent prospect of a, a new um, occupant. Examples of meanwhile uses include things like um, community facilities, creative workspaces, temporary housing and pop up shops. In terms of the um, representations um, that we received, there was general support um, for the policy, although there and there were suggestions um, for potential suitable meanwhile uses, including um, short term medical uses um, that would be available to the early residents of any community. Um, affordable housing in um, vacant um, premises and um, potential skateboard um, facilities. Um, there was um, a, a couple of representations where that they suggested that meanwhile uses shouldn't be implemented in the green belt whilst consent for a, a development was being sought. In terms of the creating inclusive employment and business opportunities through new developments policy, um, the, the policy proposes that appropriately scaled developments would contribute to local training, skills and employment opportunities. Uh, examples of this could include the provision of uh, apprenticeships, work experience, traineeships, um, uh, during the construction phase of um, a development. Um, the policy also seeks to provide access for local businesses to any procurement opportunities that are generated um, by um, the development. In terms of the representations that were received, uh, there was some support for the policy from uh, a range of different organisations. Um, with some suggestions for the detailed how the detailed policy should be developed, um, including that it should apply only to larger developments, that it should include flexibility in its application where appropriate. And there are also um, some suggestions of the different types of skills and employment provision that it could cover. Uh, there were some objections to the um, policy direction, uh, including from the Home Builders Federation, uh, who suggested um, that it wasn't justified against the NPPF and SIL regulations, and that there was existing work taking place through CITB um, in terms of providing skills and opportunity and um, employment opportunities in um, construction. Thanks, Joanna. So I'm going to talk through the final two policies. So thanks for sticking with us. Um, the proposed policy direction for pollution, health and safety uh, requires that the development does not lead to significant adverse effects as a result of noise, vibration, odour and or light pollution. And this policy also includes how land contamination should be considered. The reps raised the following points. Um, the Environment Agency suggested that policy should include protection of Cambridge's aquifers and should mitigate pollution from hazardous facilities. The University of Cambridge suggested that the policy scope should protect the research environment, particularly mitigating against electromagnetic interference. And some parish councils suggested that pollution level levels were unacceptable, so we should um, monitor and mitigate those. Uh, several developers objected to the policy, arguing that potential negative impacts from development can be mitigated against and should be included in the policy text. Our next policy is a protection of public houses. Uh, this was originally in the Great Places theme, uh, but we considered the public houses to be um, a player of an important role in the community resilience and contributing to local economy and supporting key community functions both in the city and rural areas. We also thought that this policy fostering social interaction and local community life, and so probably wasn't best placed alongside the other policies in the Great Places theme that have more of a design-led approach. 
Um, so the key points raised in the reps were general support for the policy and approach, mainly from those parish councils who supported the positive impacts such as employment opportunities for the community. Um, some comments suggested that the policy should allow for the loss of public houses if they are no longer viable and can no longer be supported by local communities. And lastly, Cambridge Past, Present and Future suggested that policy could safeguard public houses by nominating them as assets of community value. Other comments suggested that other community assets also need to be accounted for and safeguarded that aren't reflected in this policy. And I think that leads us on to our next discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, if you'd like to, any councillors would like to indicate whether they'd like to speak um, while you're thinking about that, I'd just like to say that councillor Toomey Hawkins and I have raised several times about the need to consider facilities for older teenagers and young adults. Um, and I do I do think this section has the is maybe the the least developed of all of the sections and and I think there is still evidence to be gathered but one one point that we one point is that the older teenagers and young adults and I think maybe that's why skateboarding comes up quite often um okay so uh councillor Dr Williams please yep. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just just one point from me on, on this, and it's a very parochial South Cam's point, although it is relevant to City, but we really, 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 really need to be encouraging and making provision for um, leisure facilities and swimming pool and public um, facilities in, in, in South Cam's. Um, people in South Cam's, particularly in my area, are really in, entirely reliant on the city um, and what's provided by the city council in terms of you know publicly accessible swimming pools gyms that kind of thing now i don't want to dis dis debate that here but if 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 there are disincentives in place in the future to travel into the city by car um we really are potentially going to be cutting people off um from some pretty um or disincentivizing them from using some pretty vital health and well-being um facilities so i think we really really need to grasp this and do something in south cams thank you um councillor sandford please thank you chair a couple of things from me um health impact assessment seems an excellent idea but who would deliver it is there an independent body that is qualified to do the kind of assessment um <laughs> I was smiling at the comment about electromagnetic interference. I think that was entered in the context of the Lodge Bridge radio telescopes. Um, protecting the research environment seems such a, a broad um, consideration. It'd be, I'm not sure how the planning committees are actually qualified to um, evaluate um, that kind of situation. Thank you. Um, perhaps we'll go on to Neil, uh, Councillor Shaler as well. Thank you, Chair. It, this is it, it's an enormously broad subject, isn't it? And and about um, health and well-being, and you have to get back to basics. What what we need as human beings to have to have a purpose, to be loved, to to have, you know be surrounded, and community building stuff. And and I wonder about allotments, things like Co Farm. Um, and places where people can interact with different levels of skills across generations, this sort of thing. You know, we, we tend to be in single age class, you know, at schools and that sort of stuff. But when it comes to actual longevity of communities, it's about that intergenerational stuff. But but also, you know, we've lost a lot of the uh, music, musical instrument, choirs, that, that sort of thing. You know, where, where does that fit into things? Um, Mixed martial arts, I was talking to somebody locally who was dealing with a lot of youth and he felt that he was keeping them away from knife crime by, by you know, and, and there seems to be very little um, for that particular section, you know, the, the kind of transitional 
and but of course there's gymnastics there's ballet there's, there's all kinds of things like this so and it depends on the on the site if you're near a river maybe rowing and kayaking and that sort of thing if you're near you know it, it has to be something more site specific but i'm very interested in the idea of 30 minute communities where you get most of what you need within walking distance of where you live and so this this is really um planning on a on community level if you like <clears throat> Now, Councillor Porro, have you got many questions? If you, if okay, why don't you come in now to them? No, this is much briefer for me. You'll be glad to know. Uh, just quickly, the pollution and health and safety. Should we include something there about wildlife corridors and light pollution? I don't know whether it quite fits there, but I am mindful that that is quite a big issue, certainly in the city, and I'm guessing out in South Cams as well, because that pollution can be that as well. Second thing, absolutely agree with Councillor Thorne about teenagers. Because we know we have a real deficit in that, I'd almost wonder if officers could justify actually making that really clear in the policy that we particularly want things. Because obviously with community rooms, you can provide nurseries and things for younger children. But, you know, we do need teenage provision. So I, I would welcome anything to make that stronger. So that's clear. And finally, with public houses, um, you know we've dealt with that a bit in the city it would be i wonder if it's possible to put something as well about if a pub is being redeveloped so that there is support for the landlords to, to sort of make sure it's viable when you come back to it potentially because i think that's something that's possibly come up at city planning before where it would have been useful to have something there which just reminds developers that if they are redeveloping a pub which is great they're keeping it it's nice to make sure that the the existing landlord and ladies can come back Thank you. Thank you. I hand over to the office. Are we all, are we all done? I'll start, I'll start from the top. Um, so we are updating our sports, um, sp our sports strategy to support the local plan. So that's the playing pitch strategy and the indoor sports facility strategy. And we're also commissioned an outdoor courts and rink strategy, which perhaps picks up more of the minor, minor sort of spaces, which um, perhaps is not necessarily a focus for Sport England. Um, and I am particularly conscious of, for example, the skateboarders wanting to have it. And I mean, <clears throat> I think in all our leisure sports open spaces, we do really need to start looking at making these spaces usable throughout the year, not just when it's fair weather. Um, clearly that's, you know, quite a big ask, but it is on our radar of trying to make sure these spaces are a lot more usable. Um, and um, I'd like, I mean, those those documents are going to be fairly comprehensive and should be able to pick up and develop an action plan, even for those minor sports where we're not sure how we can take them forward. But if a development comes forward, we can highlight there are perhaps a demand for these spaces. Even the, the problem with the futsal is that the requirements is slightly bigger than your standard indoor sports facility. So it takes, um, we have to, and there actually are quite large spaces, but I, I know these sports strategies are fairly comprehensive and should pick up a lot of the sports um, for all ages. Um, um, but I'm, you know, I'll clearly I can take back the fact that there's a, you know, need for older teenagers, young adults. How do we cater for that? Um, so um, if there's no further questions on that point, um, in terms of um, health impact assessments, um, from Mike's, from my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joanna that the there's a health team uh, at South Cams who have experience of these health impact assessments and they assess these and feedback to the planning application process as to whether the HIA um, is satisfactory for the development. Is that correct, Joanna? Yes, that's that's correct, yes. Okay, um, I'll be honest, I can't answer the question about electromagnetic um, and I will have to just pass that back to our, um, our respective um, environmental health um, colleagues um, as to how we can pick that up. Should we get an application for that? Um, so the broader subject of, 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 uh, of, of allotments and getting more people involved, uh, we are in discussions with um, uh, the cities and South Cam's communities and teams about whether um, we can perhaps do something about allotment spaces and food growing areas. Uh, that is a work in progress, obviously, 
there are budgets to discuss and um, I can see my boss John scratching his head already as soon as I mention it uh, but it is on our radar um, 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 mixed martial arts well again that should really be um, picked up in the indoor sports facility strategy um, and it does do comprehensive consultation um, of all the clubs who are operating in the city in South Cambridgeshire so um, I will just make a point of that for our consultants um, but normally they consult with all the clubs who use these spaces to find out what they need and the problems they've got or if they've got over capacity under capacity things like that so it is fairly comprehensive um, again um, I can from the pollution health that light pollution wildlife corridors I can feed that back to um, the relevant officers who um, at the city in South Cairns who are looking at these matters um, so public houses well um, I think the idea is, is that if a public house use is to be retained, but that involves some sort of development at the city, we normally refer these matters to camera to basically say, is this proposal realistic? Would you expect a landlord or a person to be able to inhabit it? Because we are aware of developers trying to redevelop a pub, retaining the public house use. But, oh, dear providing it in a way which actually is not really reusable as a public house. So um, we are aware of these, and I do remind my colleagues at Development Management to make sure camera have a say on whether they think the public house in its new form, mixed use, is still a working option. I think that covers off all your questions. Um, is there any follow-up? Councillor Horror, you want to come back? Oh. Just on that last one, on the pubs, I think my concern with what you're saying is brilliant. It's the bit in between. So whilst they're redeveloping, is there any suggestion that, for example, some other provision could be made and then we could check with camera whether that was sufficient? Because obviously, if you take a pub out of use for two years, you know, um, so anyway, I was just so wondering if that's I'd, possible. I'd have to. Um, yeah, I would have to. I, I'm not sure the realistic, because where would that be? It, it couldn't be on the development site. So unless there's like an adjacent site where there could be like a pop up pub or something, possibly. I mean, I can I can take it back, um, Councillor Poor, and see what we can do with that in terms of temporary provision. I think the other issue, uh, Councillor Thornbury, you mentioned, you know, this is perhaps the uh, policy area that's not developed as much as some of the others. I think the slide we haven't shown probably don't need to was capturing really the work that we're doing. Uh, to move this theme forward. So um, as Bruce mentioned, various sports studies and so on. And we are working with both councils, um, community teams, looking at how we develop those health policies, looking at issues like food growing and so on. The issue we've got to balance um, to an extent is what is the role of the plan and what is the role of um, the, the uh, planning application process? So we need to clearly set out um, the expectations that the plan has that sites need to achieve and we need to understand their impact on viability but at some extent when we get involved in these real details they're matters that might be more poured over when you're dealing with a specific site thinking about some of those major sites we talked about in the last session where you can really get into that detail so it's about making sure perhaps we've got the right hooks in the plan and thinking what level we need to do at the plan making level to make sure that those detail levels those discussions about those some of those very detailed points get picked up but I think we're aware members take you know this theme very seriously and we will very much be looking to have a really you know robust set of policies to make sure those asks can be put on those developments but it it is a work in progress but to reassure you we are working on it can i come back on a couple of points one is is following on what you've just mentioned is the look the next local plan is going to provide billion billions of pounds worth of development in this area economic opportunities and when you think about the impact of the the jobs and the homes when and you think about things like swimming pools as councillor williams was mentioning uh, when you look at the overall possibility of what could be delivered you it seems clear what might be some of the bigger things that we need in this whole area but it's how do you how do we actually split that up between the different developments to ensure that at the end we get what we need for the the totality of things so and uh one of the another thing is hidden disabilities we are, uh, uh get a lot of 
parents with children with hidden disabilities and, and adults with hidden disabilities that are not really catered for, I, I think, primarily in uh, playing facilities. But it actually now through lessons from COVID, I think there uh, we know that there's uh, what's happened that the uh, spacing that has come through the distancing that we've we've done through COVID has actually been really helpful for people with hidden disabilities. So I think there are there lessons from COVID that could help a proportion of our residents, and that is so it's about. Um, the space that's needed. And then finally, what about little things like uh, drinking fountains? You know, are there, will there be place, will we be going down to that kind of level to say every community centre needs a, a drinking uh, tap, drinking tap outside or, um, you know, in green spaces, we need to, you know, toilets for public toilets to, for, I mean, will it go? Will it go down to that kind of level eventually? Thank you, uh, Stephen Kelly. Thanks, Casey. I mean, I think the questions you raised there um, drill down to some wider considerations about how do how do the councils um, effectively ensure appropriate stewardship of places? Because historically, the local authority was responsible for paying for public toilets, water fountains, and all those kind of amenities. Um, both councils have particular, uh, in some cases, parish councils have um, picked up the responsibility in parts of South Cambridgeshire for elements of that. Obviously, the city continues to be the um, default provider in, in public spaces. Um, I think there are some quite challenging circumstances to do with the finances for local authorities about how far they can sustain those and maintain them. Um, but it is something that I, I suspect we will continue to explore as we look at some of the major strategic sites that come forwards, because development community can certainly deliver those. We only have to look at King's Cross to see how Argent are effectively providing all of those services as part of their project. Um, but it brings with it an acknowledgement that actually the occupiers of those developments need to pay for them. Uh, ultimately through the charges or the lease arrangements uh, and so on that exist. Uh, and I think that's a conversation in terms of how we transport that thinking and those liabilities into uh, the city and, and South Cambridgeshire areas because they're not concepts perhaps um, uh, that, that we've embraced so far, but I'm sure they're areas that we need to look at as we head forwards. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any more hands up. So I would just like to thank the officers for all of the work they've done to do with the consulta consultation and go wading through all the very, very, very many comments. I think we I think they should be congratulated first in the consultation, which has resulted in all the comments. But there's so much work um, go going through dealing with the comments and it's been a really, really helpful session. So thank you very, very much. If the if councillors think of any further comments that spring to mind that haven't you haven't raised, please do contact the planning officers. Um, our next uh, JL PAG meeting is uh, Monday the thirteenth of February, I believe, sometime on. So I shall close the meeting now um, and thank you 